All right. How's everyone doing today? Good? Whenever I, whenever I meet with founders you know, and ask how they're doing, the answer is always, you know, great, we're killing it, you know, crushing it. And then, you know, every investor update I ever get, you know, hundreds of them, so, you know, it's, the, it's, it's always the same, we're, we're doing great. And um, then a few months later, you know, I run into the, the founder, it's like, how are you doing? You know, how, how's the company? It's like, oh, it's over. It's, it's like, wait, what? You, you were killing it, what happened? It's like, no, we ran out of money and died. It's like, wow, what? That's crazy. You guys were just crushing it just a few months ago. And uh, it, it seems like, you know, um, this, is a, this is a common problem with startups that they seem like it's working and then somehow they go off the rails. And it can really happen at any stage. You know, in the past year, we've seen a bunch of companies that were weeks away from IPOing. You know, they were supposed to be big IPOs and then, like, they just implode on the, the verge of, of IPO. And so what I thought I'd do today, I know there's like a lot of other sessions probably advising you guys on how to find product market fit, which is definitely the number one thing that startups have to do. But what I thought I'd spend my time doing is walking through um, reasons, I think there's about 10 of them that I've kind of cataloged here, uh, that pitfalls that startups often you know, fall into um, so that you guys can maybe avoid some of these problems. And so this, this presentation is called How Not to Go Off the Rails. Uh, I'm just going to kind of walk through some of these things. So number one is the problem of negative gross margins, negative unit economics. We've seen this a lot lately with so-called tech-enabled businesses, businesses that operate in the physical world. And a business that has negative unit economics is basically selling a product for less than what it costs. So they're losing money not just at kind of the corporate level, because basically every startup is unprofitable, but they're actually losing money on every transaction which means that no matter how big they get, they're still going to be unprofitable. Um, it's the problem of selling dollar bills for, for 90 cents. And nothing will make you look like you've got a great business than selling dollar bills for 90, for 90 cents. It'll be a thriving business, but then as soon as you raise the price to the correct level, you won't have any business. And so it's very important for startups, I think, that are, especially the ones that are operating in the physical world, uh, to always be understanding, you know, not just their burn, but also what kinds of money are they losing. Again, sort of losing money at the corporate level, corporate overhead is okay, all startups do, but make sure that your union economics are, are positive. Um, and what we've seen is that, uh, you know, trying to re-engineer the union economics of a business that's already at scale is a brutally hard thing to do. You know, trying to find the scalable model when you're already operating at scale is sort of a contradiction in terms. And startups, I think, would be well advised to make sure that their unit economics work before they go into kind of hyperscaling mode. Problem number two, I'd say that, that one of the top reasons why startups kind of stall out is because they find it hard to acquire customers. Uh, distribution is usually the most difficult problem for a startup to to, to, to solve. And so what happens is they start overpaying on CAC to kind of hide the fact that they, they can't grow. And, and the reason why they can't grow is the low hanging fruit has sort of dried up. You know, maybe they went to a, you know, to a, a startup accelerator or incubator and they got all their classmates to sign up and it looked like there's a lot of growth, but then they graduated and suddenly it gets much harder. You know, maybe your initial mode of customer acquisition is email marketing and uh, you, you run out of email lists, you know? Or uh, you've got a viral feature, but the, the, the virality sort of dries up. And so um, th this sort of problem of um, the initial saturation of, a, um, of kind of an initial distribution channel uh, causing your CAC to become prohibitive is a, is a very common problem. And what I would say about this is that the best way to deal with this is from a very early stage, make sure you, you're attributing your leads correctly. You understand your, your lead attribution, what channels your leads are coming from, and make sure not to confuse them. So for example, like one of the problems that we see a lot is that you know, the inbound leads are the Glengarry leads, they close at a very high rate. The outbound leads are typically very low quality. And if you're kind of blending these things together, you might have an exaggerated sense of how good the outbound leads are, and you might sort of overscale that team. We've seen that uh, happen before. Problem number three, the leaky bucket or churn. I think everyone knows about churn, uh, but it has to be talked about. Churn is, is, can be a real problem for startups because it's a time bomb. Uh, your sales can be going great, but you know, if a deal doesn't come up for renewal until a year later, you just won't know about this, this time bomb. And, and you know, salespeople aren't necessarily incentivized to avoid sales that are, are likely to churn. Um, 
because they just want to close everything they can. And so this problem can manifest itself uh, downstream in customer support uh, you know, a, a long time down the road. The, the rules of thumb I, I like to have around this is to look at uh, retention on, on a logo basis. Uh, enterprise customers are sort of the, the highest retaining. They should retain about 95% of the time, 85% for your SMB customers. And startups turn the most. Doesn't mean you shouldn't sell to them, but they're going to have about a 75% logo retention. But what we like to see in all these cases is that on a dollar basis, you have dollar retention over 100%, meaning that your expansion from the customers who retain outweighs the, the, the churned customers. And if you can't do that, you might want to slow down your growth so that you can fix your product. Cause number four, I think of a lot of uh, rail jumping, is, is an external dependency that turns into an existential risk. Um, you see this a lot, obviously, when the, the rug gets pulled out from, from under startups that are operating on somebody else's platform. Or it could be a, a biz dev dependency. Um, I tend to like operating on, on platforms better than uh, operating on sort of contracts. Um, ironically, like having no, just, just operating based on an API relationship, I think can be a lot better than operating based on a sort of contractual relationship. But what I would tell you is that you've got to try and avoid these biz dev dependencies. I think trying to convince a big company to do something is just, uh, just as a killer for startups. They're too slow. And depending on other startups to do things for you is very risky because startups change their mind a lot and they're kind of kind of flaky. So I would say avoid biz dev dependencies. Platforms are good. Race onto platforms to sort of bootstrap your company. But then at some point, you've got to race off them to diversify this risk so the rug can't get pulled out from under you. Number five, regulatory. We've seen you know a number of high-profile startups kind of go off the rails because in part of, of some sort of regulatory problem. And what I'd say here is that regulatory uh, issues tend to fall into kind of there's, there's black, white, and, and gray areas. And a lot of startups are in gray areas because they're innovating, they're disrupting, and their innovation wasn't taken into account at the time the laws were written. And so frequently, it's, it's gray. And what I would tell you is that if what you're doing is in a gray area, I think that's fine. I think you should do it. But you need to advocate very early on for why what you're doing is in the public interest. Don't try to, to hide it. Uh, try to explain to people that your interpretation of the law is the correct one. Uh, by the same token, if what you're doing is a black letter violation of the law, don't do it. You know, I think startups think they can get away with it because in the first year or so, no one's really paying attention. But as they get bigger, uh, people will definitely pay attention. This is kind of like the Napster problem. So if it's a, a black letter violation, don't do it. Great, do it, but, but advocate. Area number six, sales compliance. You know, the sales department seems to be the locus of a lot of um, problems for companies that have kind of uh, gone off the rails. And I think part of this is, in large part, is because sales is compensated differently than the rest of the company. So the rest of the company is compensated with equity. They're kind of playing the, the infinite game. Whereas sales is typically on quarterly uh, incentive plans. They have to make quota. They're under incredible pressure to either make quota or get fired, and that can lead to, to some some bad behaviors unless they're not like tightly controlled. So like one of them that we kind of mentioned is the churn problem. Salespeople are incentivized to, to hit a number, but you know uh, how they hit that number is less tightly regulated. You have to make sure that they're not over-promising things to customers, uh, because otherwise that customer will just become a churn problem down the road. Similarly, if, uh, if you're a highly regulated company and you have to, you know, um, you have to uh, engage in and sort of uh, highly regulated activities, you should have a, a, a team outside of the sales department that's sort of monitoring the compliance because sales doesn't really have a great incentive to, to do its own com to do compliance on itself. Number seven, Mechanical Turk. So in a way, this is a version of the gross margin problem. You know, I think this is where uh, the company is doing things by hand instead of with with software. And I think some of the worst advice that's being passed around Silicon Valley these days is that. Startups should do things that don't scale. I don't quite understand why people say this. I think the whole point of a technology company is to figure out the most elegant, scalable model you can. But this advice, I think, becomes really toxic when uh, a, a fast-growing startup tries to essentially cover up uh, gaps in its product by throwing bodies at the problem. And essentially, you're faking product capabilities by using humans. And you know, these bodies are basically cogs, and they will cause a gross margin problem. It will also cause a cultural problem because the company uh, becomes dependent on sort of um, on throwing bodies at the problem instead of like inno innovating the, the product. And so I would say it's okay to do this to some degree, 
but uh, try not to, to let it become too much of a problem. Number eight, founder psychology. I think this is a really big one. In a way, founder psychology is at the root of, you know, it seems like all these companies, that, all the high-profile companies that have gone off the rails. Uh, you know, the founders are all kind of described the same way. It's like, well, you know, crazy and aggressive, visionary. Um, and, you know, when everything's going kind of up and to the right, it's like good crazy. But then when things implode, it's like bad crazy. Um, and so kind of what, what kind of explains this, this, this uh, weird dichotomy where crazy is sometimes good and, and sometimes bad? And I, I think the, the answer is that the truth is that founders have to be much more aggressive, much crazier, if you will, more visionary than, than certainly the average person. And, and those qualities are necessary and get rewarded by the world up to a certain point. Um, and I think we're used to thinking of the world as operating on a normal distribution. Uh, it doesn't. You know, I think these qualities get rewarded um, to, to, to a great degree, but then suddenly you go too far, and uh, the founder pushes things too far, and they go off the rails. And so the, the, the curve doesn't look like a, a bell curve. It actually looks like some sort of shark jumping type, type curve. And what I would say is that founders need to have some of these, these qualities, these visionary, kind of aggressive, crazy qualities, but you've got to learn to balance your psychology. And it's good to have people around you who can help make sure that you're not kind of losing perspective and you're not kind of on your way to, to going off the rails. There's a kind of company culture version of this problem. And the, I think the simplest way to understand company culture is as a macrocosm of the founder's psychology. Whatever is happening in the founder's head will be writ large across the company. If the founder is hyper-competitive, the company culture becomes very competitive. If the founder is very corporate, the, the culture becomes kind of stuffy. If the founder is kind of warlike, the, found, the, the company culture will be very aggressive. And if the founder is kind of cuts corners, the, the, the company culture can become reckless. And what I'd say is that the founder's behavior gets role modeled. You, if crazy founder equals crazy culture. And so what you want to do is not just balance your own psychology, you want to balance your founding team. And so that the, the, the sort of the hive mind uh, of the company is, is sort of has psychological balance to it. Um, and I'd also just add that values must mature over time. The things that will work for you in the early stages may not work for you later. Facebook changed its motto from move fast and break things to move fast and build scalable infrastructure because you just can't get away with um, some of the things you can get away with uh, when, you're, when you're a bigger, bigger company. Macro shock, number 10. So this, in a way, is a trigger for a lot of the reappraisals that go on um, because normally when a company has these problems, uh, it's because they're not internally recognized and the, the um, reappraisal happens uh, usually because of some sort of external event. So we've seen lately as company goes out for IPO, everyone at the company thought it was doing great. They were drinking the Kool-Aid and then all of a sudden, you know, the public markets uh, sort of uh, pop the bubble. Or it can be, you know, it could be any fundraising round, you know, company goes out to try and raise money and all of a sudden they, you know, investors kind of pop this, this sort of this bubble. And, you know, we saw this around the dot-com crash. It can happen to any sector that's sort of uh, hot for a while and then falls out of favor. You know, like um, you take something like crypto, where you know it's, it felt like all the rules got suspended because it was a hot space in, in terms of rules about how much revenue you should have or users you should have. And what happens is when the space is no longer hot, the rules uh, reapply, and all of a sudden you've got to show revenue, you've got to show real users, and so the, the bubble the bubble gets gets popped. Now, you know, this is sort of a parade of horribles, and I want to kind of couch this in. This is kind of number eleven commoditization. This is the, the red queen effect where it sometimes it feels as a startup that you know, we're moving really fast but we're staying in the same place um, because of competition. You know, there's always lots of startups that are seemingly chasing us and kind of on our tail. Commoditization isn't something we cause, it's something that can happen to us if we don't move fast enough. And I think this is one of the, the big dilemmas about you know, this, this sort of presentation is yes, there's this parade of horribles that can happen, but if you don't move fast enough, then you'll, your idea will get commoditized, competitors will win the market. And so really what I'm urging in this presentation is not taking no risk. You have to take risk, you have to move fast, but it's to have a, a, a sort of more balanced view of the debt that you're accumulating, sort of the, the, the cultural debt, the operational debt, the, the gross margin debt and so on, so that you can pay down this debt over time instead of having it become a problem that's so acute that your startup goes off the rails. Thank, thank you everyone.